Thank you very much, guys. It's wonderful to be here because I get to experience how it was to be on my own panel, and I have a chance to personally, verbally respond to my reviewers. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how I actually got the NSF Career Award, and first I would like to give you an explanation of what my research is about. I think it can be presented quite easily with the following example. A road diverges in the desert. Lexus. The road you're on, John Anderton, is the one less traveled. Well, here you see the main character, right? So he's identified seamlessly. And then the environment reacts to John Anderton, right? And places the content to where he is looking. So in my lab, we are doing both things. And I'm not sure how many of you heard about biometrics before. Well, biometrics is supposed to make our life much easier so you don't have to remember passwords because you know, we are not designed to remember a lot of random information. But the system would identify us based on who we are, not based on what we remember, such as password, or what we have, such as a card of some sort. However, biometric te technology, one of the biggest challenges is spoofing. And I have another movie to show you how bad it's going to be. <laughs> so you can see here that the intruders are breaking into very sophisticated biometric system. And you can see, well, this is too futuristic looking. But this is not exactly true, because right now you can spoof a commercial iris recognition system by capturing your eye image at a distance, printing it on a high quality picture, and just presenting it to the commercial system. And the system would identify that this is you. And so my goal, one of the goals of the proposal, was to counter this. OK, uh, giving you another idea in terms of the, what I'm going to do in my research. What you're going to see is a trailer from Hobbit. Think about it. The directors look ex work extremely hard, so all people who see the movie are going to see look at the same spot. So what you're going to see here, eye movements from two people. And you can see how different or similar they are. You seek that which would bestow upon you the right to rule. The quest to reclaim a homeland and slay a dragon. So you see, actually, though, they kind of looked at the same place. They, the eye movements actually temporarily, temporarily and spatially are different. So do you think this idea would be able to get you SATC funding? Well, it did. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the eye movements are different. Well, scientifically speaking, what is happening is that there is a camera. So for example, iris scanner just as a camera that captures sequences of your eye images. And so what I propose and I propose in my proposal is that from the sequence of eye images, I'm able to extract the internal non-visible structure of your eye. That means muscles, the tissues of those muscles, the properties of those muscles, the properties of the fat tissues that surround the eye globe, and also your brain. So all of this mathematically extracted just from the sequence of your eye images. 
You don't have to have any new hardware. You just have an iris scanner that already exists, and with a software upgrade, you can get all this new information. Plus, it can work on the web cameras, but web cameras can be modified a little bit, so it would work. So this is the uh, primary idea, and the good thing is, about it that because the additional modalities it becomes more accurate than iris and it's very hard to spoof it why because you cannot take a, you cannot easily take an image of your brain or the muscles inside of your eye socket and just recreate it so even mathematically we proved that theoretically it would be almost impossible to do that okay so that's the idea uh, some uh, more broader impact because from the brain and from the oculomotor plan, those muscles, we are extracting so many metrics about human behavior. Not only we can detect the identity, but we can detect psychological and physiological state. We already showed that, for example, you can detect mild traumatic brain injury. You can detect fatigue. And we are confident that you can, for example, detect autism or many pathologies that are related to human vision or the way how the brain works uh, in terms of the human visual system. Plus, a lot of work that was done before concentrated, especially in, on psychology, in terms of how similar we are as humans. And very rarely, almost biometrics is the only science that studies how different we are. And before this research, the focus was on static traits, such as iris or fingerprints. But right now, uh, this project allows you to have tools and metrics that would decode your internal state. And based on this state, uh, something can be done, such as an identity recognition. And societal impacts, I don't know how many of you, but right now there is a project in India when government to prevent uh, identity theft is enrolling 1.2 billion people in its system to uh, combat the identity theft. And so this technology can be easily incorporated with a software upgrade to benefit so nobody can take an image of your eye at a distance, replicate it with a print of paper and spoof the system. So this technology can immediately help there. Well, I hope that you thought that it was impressive. Where did I start? Well, when I graduated, this is where I started. Probably you don't understand what it is, but basically it's a mathematical model of the human eye. And this is where I was. I did not have any idea of what security is, what is SATC program, what is NSF. This is the only thing I have. This is the only thing I had. And from this, I transitioned to a successful proposal. So my first attempt was, I had this you know, mathematical model that I spent you know, years created. And so uh, I came to the academia, was you know, passionate about helping students, so we need to get funding uh, you know, to get students. So I decided, what can I do with my oculomotor plant? Well, first of it, I can make a better plant, you know, better model, mathematical model that represents human visual system. Or I can do some fancy human-computer interaction where, for example, you would be able to uh, control a computer just by moving your eyes, no hands or keyboard. And the third idea I had when I thought about the model, the parameters of the model actually came just with th from three people, very limited source. All of them had surgery. So that's how hard it was to get those internal parameters. So this is where I started with those uh, three ideas. And my first challenge was Texas State does not have a PhD program. So coming with this all mathematical background, my undergraduate degree, by the way, is math, it was very hard to break down into smaller problems so my undergraduate students would be able to work on it, and learn, and produce something new. So it took time. In addition, uh, not to say bad things about Texas State, but uh, Lyndon Johnson, since Lyndon Johnson graduated from Texas State in 1930, there were, my career proposal was fourth. So this was the environment uh, that I had to work with to be successful. Now it's much, much better. The institution is, ac is actually pushing very hard for research, but I did not have good resources to help me in that. 
And by good resources, I, I basically I could not come to the faculty that were successful. The research expenditure, for example, for my department when I came in was zero. I'm not exaggerating for the uh, external research. So I didn't know what to do. So I started sending a lot of emails to program directors asking them, are those any three ideas, you know, ring a bell? I tried to, you know, read the solicitations, but some of them are kind of, you know, either too general or sometimes cryptic, so I was lost. And I, you know, trying to find the confirmation that I was doing the right thing. Because I strongly believe that you have to work very hard on the proposal, but to do this, you have to get the feedback that you're doing the right thing. And that was hard. So what I learned that I had to be very persistent. So uh, people at NSF are wonderful people, but I think they are overloaded a lot of times. And so sometimes, you know, the responses take a little bit of time. Just be polite, ask again, send email. And so that's your job to get a response. So, and I tried to get the feedback. Even I went to, and I went over to Washington and started talking to the program directors, you know, is this idea appropriate to the program? And again, some responses were kind of cryptic to me, so I did not get the feel, wow, this is the right thing. And so uh, I decided to apply with all those three ideas, right? So you saw those three ideas in the proposal. And, uh, Additional help that I got, I basically got the list of all people who successfully got the funding from the programs that I was going to apply them and send them email, can you share the proposal? So I probably approached 200 people, created emailing list. Approximately 60% sent me their proposal. And those who said, well, maybe I'm a little bit, some, somebody did not respond, some others say, well, I'm not comfortable, but I would be willing to review yours. And then immediately you get sort of a free help. So, uh, in reading those proposals helped me a lot because I just didn't know where to start. So, I contacted people and so they were able to review and provide it. One of those people uh, who I was able to solicit, uh, solicit help, and I'm very thankful, was Ellen Hine, who was the head of uh, Brain and Cognitive Science Institute at the time at MIT, and who was very kind to uh, review my first proposal. Okay, so what was the official review? And so you guys were extremely right. You were saying all the right things during your discussions, at least for the uh, panel that I was on. So the feedback was too many aims. And here they advise that if you have too many aims, it's very hard to defend. Each idea has its own, you know, sort of ground expertise. So you have to defend against each of them. Broader impact is that clear how this, you know, wonderful Aquila Motor plant model is going to change anything in the world. That was unclear. Insufficient preliminary results, and I explained to you why, but, you know, nobody cares at the panel what problems you had. You have to have those results to be successful. But the most important comment was that biometric component was very interesting. And this is where I decided, wow, this is I need to, you know, specifically work on that. My second attempt was incorporating all this feedback that I got, plus uh, I have to convince my own community, biometrics community, that my work makes sense. So nobody really worked on this before. So I, I had to create my field myself. So Everybody said, wow, you know, eyeball movement, what is it, you know, doesn't make sense. Aries, you know, forever. That was the, that kind of the receptive. When I came to John Dogman, who is grandfather of eye movements, he said, uh, who is the grandfather of iris, so he was very skeptical about this, uh, but, and so I hope to prove that uh, it makes sense. And so it took me basically, you know, coming to the people who are, you know, important, in the biometrics community and basically explaining to them why it makes sense. My paper uh, was rejected multiple times. On the third attempt only it, was, it went through and we got the best paper award. But it was very, very hard to convince to the biometric community that it made sense. Okay, again, I, talked, I, went, to NSF, I, I went to NSF in person and so uh, Carl Rand, uh, Landwehr was very kind to give me a document that basically said, you know, grand challenges of biometrics as decided by uh, biometrics committee, 
that allowed me to talk in the language that made the community understand that my work makes sense. This is very important. Coming from mathematical and from this modeling background, I didn't know, you know anything about biometrics, even the terms, so I had to learn. And getting to the, going to the NSF officer and getting this document was instrumental in helping. So concentrated on one areas, uh, use the language concepts that are understood by the community, providing better structure to the proposal. Out clear goals, I had to provide those for each section and the results. I spent a lot of time on the, this attempt, so I probably worked only on this proposal for five months. My wife started complaining, saying that she married a professor, and professors are supposed to have free time, and so if your wife starts <laughs> complaining about that, you know that you're in trouble, so you know, finally I pushed it and submitted it. Official review, not funded, right? By the way, if you uh, would like to know what was the rating on the first proposal that I reviewed, it was not even reviewed by the panel. It was rejected basically on the reviewer level. It even didn't go to the panel. So on the second attempt, which I spent you know, five months of my life, I got the feedback that you know, how this ocular biometrics that you're proposing is better than, you know, for example, iris scanning. So I did not clearly explain that. And how the proposal meets the goals of SATC program, right? By the way, you did not review this version, but this is the, where the most uh, change occurred. And so my third attempt plan was, you know, clearly explain the advantages of ocular biometrics do not say that you know it's competing against iris, but just saying that it makes it better, so nobody, uh, everybody would see those advantages very clearly. And then I scan specifically for this piece that you can read, why it makes it relevant to SATC program, and I had a half a page explanation why it is. And I did extra step, more papers got accepted, I co-organized eye movement biometrics competition to bring more awareness. I contributed a little bit to the NIST liveness standard on liveness, and liveness, by the way, is the spoofing, how you can spoof the system. And contributing to the larger projects such as UDI, I basically provided them a specification of a device that they can use to prevent spoofing. And finally, the word. So that was, I was so elated, and that was, you know, one of the happiest days of my life, scientifically. Believe me, and then when you worked for months and months and months and finally get it, it's overwhelming, but it's worth it. Okay, summary, uh, work on the idea that will definitely bring significant broader impacts. Your idea should defend uh, itself. You cannot, work on the, you cannot work on the idea that is not exciting. Scope of work should be manageable and defendable. It's a fine balance, but work hard to get it right. Submit to the correct program. It's possible to get feedback. Do go and get that feedback from the program directors. Clear structure, goals, and outcomes must be explicitly provided. This is what I learned. And start working early if the submission deadline is in July. March should be the first draft. So that's it. And I would like to thank NSF and SATSI program for uh, and Rebecca for inviting me. Thank you so much. Just a real quick comment. People frequently ask what, uh, for an example of a really good broader impact, um, and Oleg's proposal is one of the best broader impacts that I've seen in uh, two and a half years at NSF, and you have copies of his proposal, so I encourage you to read the broader impact on the winning one. Uh, it's really very, very good. Do you believe that the fact that it took you five months helped you to make a better program for Reno and maybe do a better project? In other words, did the NSF's rigid system actually help you get a better result? Of program? course, of course. So this feedback was really important. Uh, so the reason why I applied, you know, first time to three programs, I actually applied to three different programs just to get this initial feedback. So initial feedback was very important, and the second time I could still improve. So definitely 
right now when I'm asked to review a proposal, I mean, after just scanning the first few pages, I can tell, you know, how good it is. And this is just because I thought months and months how to phrase things, how to put them, and you're fighting just for words. You're doing, you know, automatic hyphenation, so it's a basically a paragraph by paragraph logical battle in your mind in terms of how you, some guy said, you know, why didn't you write, you know, for example, about fusion and ocular biometrics? Well, if I write more about it, then I have to cut on the paragraph about the broader impacts, and this is more important. And so it, this is constant internal battle in you as a PI, you know, to get it right. And you have to please everybody and defend your own ideas. And so this is sort of like, you know, the struggle to get it done. But again, it's worth it. And for, for me especially, because, you know, Texas State basically gets students, I mean, they're very low-income students who work, you know, 40 hours just on the side to get their tuition. I mean, it's very rewarding to get them through the careers where they can be rewarded for their hard work. So it's, it's extremely rewarding. All right. Thank you so much. So... Can I ask you to take it offline? Sorry. Yeah, and I'll be, if you send me email, I'll be very happy to respond to any of you. Or we can even take it online. Just the, the people that have the one-on-ones that are scheduled now need to go do those. Um, but then if you want to ask it to anyone else that's still here, we can do that. Um, but I think